Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the PFN Scouting Podcast. I am your host, Alton Miller, joined, as always, by my co-host, Ian Cummings. And today, we are talking about quarterbacks 6 through 10 in Ian's top 10 quarterbacks of the 2024 NFL Draft. As it stands today, it will obviously change throughout the course of the season, or it might not. We have no earthly idea what is going to happen, but... We're going to get started, and we're going to start with number 10. We're going to go down to number 6, and then we are going to hit some honorable mentions because there's one in particular that I have to talk about. Then we're going to finish this podcast up by talking about the prospects that everybody should be looking out for in Week 0 of college football. That is correct, guys. Saturday, we have college football. It is back, and I could not be more excited, but first of all, I got to ask, as always, Ian, how are you doing today? Doing good, man. Doing good. It's crazy how fast college football just kind of came up, man. We thought we had a few months, then all of a sudden, bam, it's right around the corner. So, uh, But it's the best time of year. It's the time we live for, you know, the grind week in and week out. And, you know, obviously a very strong quarterback class to go through. A lot of positions are very intriguing this year, but, you know, all through the summer we've noticed – And, you know, part of that is about guys going back to school, right? Part of that is just the depth of talent that's there, but a very deep quarterback class and a very deep senior quarterback class as well. And I think that's something that we've seen with the Shrine Bowl 1000, the Senior Bowl watch list. There's a lot of talent out there. And we uh, gave our top five a few podcast episodes ago. So if you all want to check that out, you can. But uh, today, six through 10, another very strong, very intriguing group. And uh, let's waste no more time. Let's get right into it. Yes, but before, make sure that you guys are following us wherever you guys listen to your podcast. Make sure that you guys are giving us those five-star reviews. Make them funny. You know, make fun of us. uh, Make fun of yourself. I don't really care. Do it. And guys, listen to your podcast on like 1.5x or 2x because it's it's hilarious when you do it that way. (laughs) So we are going to get to it. And we're going to start off with number 10. That would be Spencer Rattler, the quarterback from the real USC, South Carolina. Yeah, uh, he's a guy who's, it feels like he's been in the draft circulation for like two to three years now. It really does. I mean, he's been in the eligible pool for a long time now, back to when he was at Oklahoma, and a lot of mock drafts had him and Sam Howell going number one, number two, right? That's just a, re- that's kind of representative of how much things can change, right? And this cycle, we've got Caleb Williams, we've got Drake May, a little easier to bank on them because of the early success they've had, the traits that are there, but you just, you never can know for sure. And I think Rattler is a good example of that. That said, being at South Carolina, being in that new situation, you know, still some questions that he needs to answer heading into this year, right? You know, there's still the volatility operationally that we've seen at times, but you can't deny the arm talent is up there near the top of the board, right? And down the stretch last year, I believe, you know, the last eight or 10 games, he was on a tear, you know, and he his efficiency noticeably took a step up, right? So it's just kind of sustaining that. I haven't had a chance to watch him in depth. I know you had the SEC. So, you were tweeting about him a lot a few days ago, right? We were, we were kind of following it live, right? You know, the, the swings of emotion. So Spencer Rattler, you know, he was a highly touted recruit. He's got the talent for sure. He makes you want to love him on tape. But, you know, tell me what you saw, because I know you've had a chance to really dive in on his film. Yeah, the arm is awesome. And that's kind of what we look like. Guys that look like quarterbacks. And when he is out there on the field, he looks like a quarterback with how he operates throwing the football. Outside of that, it's a total wild card. And when I look at a quarterback, what I like to see is the confidence to make decisions early. And he just doesn't have that. Everything I see from him is very see it, throw it. And that's just not going to work at the next level. When I I look at quarterbacks, I like to see, you know, how do they operate as a passer? And then In addition to that, what do they bring outside of structure and what do they bring as a runner? And unfortunately for Spencer Rattler, the environment has shifted a little bit in the way that we evaluate quarterbacks and in the way that we value the ability to run the football. And although he is athletic enough to get out of the pocket and make plays with his arm, he is not a runner and he hasn't been a runner since high school. I mean, even dating back to high school, he was not a true dual threat guy. He did not run the ball very much in high school. So I think when I look at him, you need to either have the operational side of things down pat and be able to be automatic in the way that you process the field, 
or you need to be able to bring something else to the game. And I just don't think that he has that consistency yet. My issue is with him being a fifth year guy now, is it going to click? Because if it doesn't click, you're looking at a guy who maybe round six, round seven, I think at the best. But if it does click, this is a guy who you can look at in that kind of Davis Mills mold where the upside might not be ridiculous. But if he gets into a good situation on day two, he could be a guy who could produce for a team that has the wide receivers and the blocking to facilitate that. But the operational side of things has to get better for him. Yeah. Well, how do you feel about the situation that he's in to kind of finish on a high note in South Carolina? Because we know they have a few weapons. Antoine Juice Wells, a wide receiver, mm-hmm. kind of the headliner there. But they've got some good blockers on the offensive front, too. How do you feel about his chances of finishing on that high note and reaching his ceiling? Yeah, the offense itself, I, I didn't hate it. And there's a lot of times where I watch college guys and it's like, this offense sucks for evaluating an NFL quarterback. And there's a lot of easy throws in, in that South Carolina offense, but there's a lot of easy throws throughout college football there, throughout the NFL level as well. And I think when you look at this, I, I think for me, it's how he processes the intermediate. Uh, the one thing that did annoy me about this offense is they like to run a lot of vertical stretch concepts to the boundary. Mm-hmm. And when you have a guy that has the type of arm that Spencer Rattler has, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. You should be using that space to your advantage. And I also don't like that because it condenses everything a little bit more and it makes that read harder for him and it makes it harder for him to pull the trigger. So let's get those to the field this year. Let's spread out defenses a little bit more and let's use his arm to your advantage more often. Yeah, I like that for sure. And I hope they do that because as you mentioned, the arm definitely pops with him. I mean, it's not a weakness by any stretch and not just the arm strength too. Like he's got an elastic arm. Like you look at how he can operate off platform. That's a definite plus for him. I think we're gonna have a similar conversation with Quinn Ewers, a couple, a couple numbers down the line. We're not getting to him quite yet. He's number seven, I believe. So we'll get to him. But you know, a guy who's not an elite athlete, a very good creator with that elasticity and off platform ability, but the extra dimension that you can add with your mobility Maybe not quite there with those guys, but let's go to number nine, uh, Jeff Sims from Nebraska. One guy that you can talk about, the mobility, the physical traits are definitely there with him. I got a chance to watch him in depth this morning, actually, but first, Dalton, have you gotten any exposure to him? No, no exposure to to Jeff Sims yet, so let me know how it is. So uh, transfer to Nebraska from Georgia Tech, and it was really interesting. He got thrown into the fire as a true freshman in 2020. Um, mixed results, as you might expect, 13 touchdowns, 13 interceptions. And, you know, he never got a really a a sustainable chance, a stable chance at Georgia Tech to, you know, kind of carry over growth from year to year. Right. So that's one thing that you notice. The situation was not very stable for him. Uh, And last year, you know, he started a few games. He played against Clemson. Right. Had some up and down reps. Right. And then transferred to Nebraska this offseason and Nebraska. They're well regarded or not well regarded, but a lot of uh, buzz around their hire of Matt Rule from the Carolina Panthers. Uh, I think he built up Temple. He built up Baylor back when he was at the college football level. A lot of people think he just fits better there. And I'm excited to see what they can do, because you look at Jeff Sims, the things that jump out to me obviously the physical traits and i think that's one reason we have him on this top 10 list because especially in the summer you have some room to project with guys like this who show that physical talent and it is definitely there with him six foot four 220 uh the dude is an athlete right i mean he's explosive he's very you know twitchy in short areas one thing i like to see with guys who are bigger right you know obviously you've got that straight line speed but can you make guys miss too and he's got that one cut agility as well he's got pretty good flexibility uh so all that is there with him and at 6'4 220 a strong frame you know that's one thing I was watching JJ McCarthy as well and McCarthy is a phenomenal creator but he played you know 200 pounds soaking wet last year probably 195 right so a leaner guy who doesn't have that play strength to fight through contact and you see that with Jeff Sims and then the arm talent as well uh very easy velocity high velocity release uh really good elasticity too he can adjust his arm angles and throwing slots a little bit and then the, the the throwing motion is very crisp, very fast. It's actually more mechanically sound than I expected. Uh, so it, it comes very naturally to him. The thing I want to see from Sims is just you're in a stable situation now. Can you sustain growth from week to week? We never saw that at Georgia Tech. And I think part of that is he didn't have the opportunity to. But, you know, I think a lot of times he took the easy throw, right? He took what was given and that's good, right? But there were some times where he deferred to his check down very quickly. You know, when he's working in a traditional pocket situation, has to go through his reads, 
that's where things start to collapse for him, right? So I want to see more of that expanding beyond just, you know, catching and throwing, right? You know, because he did a lot of that and he's he's good at it. He can do it. Um, but I do want to see some more expansion on the operational side there. So he's a very much a projection right now. Uh, a lot of these guys, like Spencer Rattler, uh, you know, we have a few years to go off of already. Jeff Sims, we do have a few years, but there's a big asterisk with this one because he's never been in a situation that he's in right now in Nebraska. And they have some good weapons. Uh, they have good offensive linemen. So I'm excited to see what he does. I think there's a lot of projection, but the Big Ten, uh, definitely a good stage for him to kind of test his metal. And if he can reach a ceiling, you know, we've seen him in some round one mocks. It's a big projection. But again, you know, uh, we saw Bo Nix in a few round one mocks a couple of years ago, right? Because the talent was there and now he's starting to reach that trajectory, right? So it doesn't happen with every guy, but when they have that physical talent to set themselves apart, you make notice of it. And I think Jeff Sims definitely has it. Moving on to number eight, we have Washington quarterback Michael Penix junior and he is uh what the exact opposite of somebody <laughs> like jeff sims right somebody who the physical talent is fine it, it's it meets the requisite levels to be an nfl quarterback but the upside is very limited overall with michael Penix. i think when you look at him operationally i love him i really enjoyed what i saw from him at washington last year i did get to watch him a little bit in depth and i thought that he was a more the way that i like to say it is supercharged version of a teddy two gloves somebody who not the biggest arm in the world not the best athlete in the world, but I think he's a little bit more creative as a runner than Teddy Bridgewater is. I think that he's more physical. And I think that overall, operationally, I really like what I saw from him. I like the natural accuracy with him. And he's, again, one of those guys who, in the correct situation, I mean, I really look at him as the evolution of what maybe Spencer Rattler could be, except Rattler has that arm talent to really put him over the top if he reaches that ceiling. I think Penix is already there. I don't know how much better he will get at the NFL level, but I think he's somebody who would absolutely be serviceable at the very least as a decent backup at the NFL level, kind of like Teddy Bridgewater has been. And, and Bridgewater was obviously a first round pick, so it's a little bit different. But I, I think Penix is a guy who on, you know, late day two, Early day three is a guy who could come in and have, you know, a a Ryan Fitzpatrick like 15 year career as that long term backup. Yeah, I could see that. I think that's the floor for him. I think, um, you Mm -hmm. know, you you mentioned, you know, I think the thing that comes to mind with Penix is a relatively complete profile relative to what you would expect from him. This is a guy who started his career at Indiana, right, and had some really high high octane moments. We all remember that game winning rushing touchdown. I think it was against Penn State. I can't remember which team exactly it was against, but diving for the pylon, right? Uh, the competitive toughness is there that you want in a backup, right? I think once you rule out a quarterback as a potential starter, that's when you look for, all right, does he have competitive toughness, resolve in those tight situations? If I, if I can put him in in a pinch, can he hold out, right? And Penix can definitely do that. I was actually a little higher on his arm strength, I think. You know, I think not elite by any means, in my opinion, but, you know, I do think the velocity generation was pretty solid from him to multiple levels. I think, especially with Penix, you look at, you know, his field vision. He's able to pick out windows outside the numbers. He's able to process really quick reaction speed to breaks from what I saw. And then not just that, but converting on that and generating the necessary velocity to layer it into those tight windows and push it past tight coverage. And I did see that at times from him. So, you know, I think the arm talent is, you know, not elite, but I do think, you know, you mentioned a souped up, uh, you know, supercharged Teddy Bridgewater. I can definitely see that the creation capacity is kind of where it fades off a little bit for him. And it's not that he's bad. I think he's above average for sure. You know, I think especially when he has a linear lane to kind of gear up a little bit, he's got decent speed uh, for sure. But at his size with his frame, a little bit of hip, hip stiffness. And I think that shows up when he needs to create, when he needs to change direction and evade guys quickly, isn't always able to do that. And then at the same time, too, I think the biggest thing for him, the biggest red flag down the line, because you mentioned it, you know, he's got the processing ability. He's got the good he's got enough baseline talent for you. um, And then he's got 
shoot accuracy, precision, I think situationally, I mm-hmm. think that that's there for sure. So, you know, you check all those boxes. I think the biggest question for him come draft time, you know, is it going to be NFL combine medicals because he has multiple season ending injuries on his history, you know, on his record. And, you know, that's something that could flag him and send him down the board. And particularly if he's, you know, graded as a day two guy from coaches and evaluators, right? That's something that might push him down to day three, right? So, you know, there's some volatility that comes with that. But, you know, when you're looking for a senior quarterback who checks all the boxes, might not have that elite physical ceiling, but has enough arm strength to test those tight windows and has the operational qualities to maximize that, that's exciting, right? You know, I, I real quick, because he's a lefty, right? You know, we don't see lefties. Mm-hmm. Does that play tricks on your eyes at times when you're watching the tape? Because I know for me, sometimes I got to look at a throw like a couple of times over, just like, all right, like maybe there's a little more pace here than I thought, you know, with lefty guys. Is it because we're not used to it? I'm, I'm right handed. I assume you are, too. But, you know, it's, uh, does that mess with you a little bit? Yeah, I forget who told me this, but there's a, a somewhat prominent evaluator NFL draft guy out there that actually flips the tape around and watches them from the right side. So they 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 flip the tape, they they make sure that they're looking at them from a, a view that they recognize. Because mm-hmm. you're right, looking at a left-handed quarterback is completely different. And mechanically, I, I think that lefties just are a little bit different by nature. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's probably part of the reason why they were looked at as like witches back in the day, because <laughs> lefties do things a little bit differently. Uh, but I, I think it's just it's just a little bit different. Like you said, the the hip stiffness is a little bit there like you see it with Tua it's like is that arm really NFL caliber or are we sure about this like does he have the juice but you're right being a left-handed quarterback automatically makes things look a little bit weird and the ball spinning the opposite direction so it's a little bit weirder for wide receivers as well but at the end of the day I don't think it matters all that much and for me personally I don't need a guy to be perfect mechanically especially in the upper body you know with the way that a guy throws i think a lot of the times when we see these lefties there's a little bit bigger loop there's a little bit more elongated motion overall but it's just i think kind of the way that our eyes play tricks on us i I really do and it's one of those things too with Penix in particular like as long as you keep your shoulders level as long as you get the ball out quickly you know those are ways that you can counteract that right and he's Mm -hmm. strong he can do that so at the very least that helps that helps for sure um we got number seven now and is that yep number seven is texas quarterback quinn ewers so uh i'll let you start and then i'll take over with with yours yeah, he's a he's an interesting one because I remember coming into this offseason, right? Everyone, you know, anytime you kind of reset in the offseason, you kind of recalibrate and get the new rankings out. And who's at the top, right? Who are the first names that are coming to mind? And Quinn Ewers was up there, one of those first names after, you know, Caleb Williams and Drake May, obviously. But, you know, people are asking, who are the top quarterbacks in the next year's class? You know, you got Williams, you got May, you got the the seniors, Bo Nix and Jordan Travis, who we mentioned last week, uh, Riley Leonard from Duke, but then Quinn Ewers, J.J. McCarthy, they're in that group too. And so, you know, Ewers obviously has the pedigree to go off of, former five-star recruit, signed with Ohio State initially, uh, then transferred to Texas where he got that first opportunity in Steve Sarkeesian's offense. Uh, last year was a little up and down, right, productive-wise, but you want to look at that tape and, you know, see if there's any translatable factors, right? So, you know, that's what that's what, that's what what I did. And, you know, looking at the tape, man, I'm going to pull up my notes here, but the up and down theme definitely carried over. That's what I'll say. I, I think, um, you know, the talent is through the roof, the arm talent anyway, the arm elasticity, I think. Interestingly enough, I didn't think his arm strength was elite, right? I think he has good arm strength, but the elite velocity – wasn't quite there for me. I think the bigger selling point with his composite arm talent is his ability to just, you know, universally adjust his arm angle. I mean, it is effortless for him. And I think that's something that's very valuable, especially when you're, you know, in a modern NFL where off platform throwing, you know, being versatile, being able to, you know, operate with a number of different release points. That's very valuable. And Quinn Ewers definitely has that. I mean, he does not even have to try and he's out here side arming it or maybe, you know, even kind of obtuse underhanding it. Right. I mean, the arm elasticity, the angle freedom with him is insane. And I think that's what we have to lead with because he can generate good velocity from a number of different launch points. And, you know, it's so effortless for him to do that. Uh, But, you know, aside from that, I think that's the biggest selling point for him right now. 
because ultimately operationally, uh, the tape was a little more volatile than I would have liked. I think, you know, especially mechanically, you know, something that comes kind of a byproduct of that arm elasticity and that freedom is a lack of control at times, a lack of, you know, you know, consistency with your mechanics and discipline, right? You know, he's flowing with his feet a lot. You know, he's not always getting set in the right spot because he's just kind of out there ad-libbing it, right? And he's, he makes it look so natural, but I want to see more discipline and more composure, you know, a little more control with those mechanics so we can channel that arm talent effectively. And, you know, processing wise too, you know, I, I don't know if he's there yet from a field vision standpoint, a lot of delays uh, between diagnosis and trigger, right? So, you know, I think things like that, you know, mentally and mechanically and decision making as well too. There's times where he's really relying on the arm talent to a fault um, and forcing throws that he shouldn't, right? So, you know, accuracy can be very volatile for him too. The ball placement, just because he doesn't have that control, right? It's a really, for me, it's kind of a percolating effect through his entire game that kind of stems from that, not carelessness, but, you know, kind of being a rogue with your mechanics, right? You know, I want, and it's a great quality to have, especially when in modern NFL, when you need to be malleable and flexible and, you know, withstand adversity. But Quinn Ewers, the bottom line is he needs more control with that. I think he can get there. I think more experience is going to help with him. He's got a great supporting cast with guys like Xavier Worthy, Isaiah Nayor, uh, Adonai Mitchell transferring over from Georgia. You got Jatavian Sanders at tight end, right? So you've got the talent to elevate you. I think, you know, he just needs to get more control, more discipline with his mechanics, with his mental work, and that'll come with time. But I think at the same time, one thing that we we mentioned earlier, you know, briefly He's not an elite athlete, and that shows up too. You know, he's got enough mobility to work off script, kind of like Spencer Rattler, but he's not a guy who's going to be a threat for defenses on his legs, you know, individually. So, you know, taking that into account, not having that elite athleticism and creation capacity to bail you out when you need it, that's something that he's going to have to counteract with more development on the operational side. I think you can get there with more time, like I said, but that's kind of a caveat. And I personally have him graded as like an early day three guy heading into the year. I think he can absolutely get to round one, early round capital, but he's got some work to do for sure. I would just like everybody to know that we do not discuss how we feel about these prospects before we get into this. And it's really funny because I don't think I disagree with a single thing you said during that entire trip. I, and I even pulled up my notes to make sure <laughs> smooth, easy placement on the underneath quick stuff. Listen, Steve Sarkeesian, look what he did for Mac Jones. Okay. Look what he did for somebody who doesn't have that elite NFL skill set. being able to get the ball out quickly, being able to find playmakers underneath, get that quick game going, get the screen game going. That's the kind of stuff that I actually really like from Quinn Ewers, that confidence in the operational side of things for those. But the NFL concepts, the more NFL concepts, those intermediate concepts, I don't love it as much. I don't think it's there. And I actually said this, and it, it kind of shocked me because I have heard so much about his arm talent I wrote it down. I don't think he has plus NFL arm talent. I think that when I say that, I mean velocity overall. Yeah. I think when you, you're right, when you look at the the arm elasticity, as you love to say, his the freedom of movement that he has in his release, I, I think is really good. He reminds me a lot just overall of Zach Wilson. That, that's that's kind of what I look look at when I look at him operationally. I don't love him as much. I don't think he's as good of a downfield thrower as Wilson. I think that he could be, but I think mechanically, especially in his lower half, he is just all over the place, especially when he throws downfield. He's halfway levitating sometimes mm -hmm. when he's throwing the ball downfield. And you're just not going to be able to get the consistency that you need when your feet are not sturdy underneath of you. I think the other thing that he doesn't do very well is sequencing to his right. So you have to, as a right-handed quarterback, going to the short right area of the field is almost the hardest throw that you can make because you have to get your shoulders across, but you can't go too far and you can't do it too quickly so that you're then coming across your body and you're kind of stuck floating to that right side still. And a lot of guys do that very poorly. Lamar Jackson is a guy who really struggled with that in college. You need to settle yourself down and find yourself mechanically for those throws. And he doesn't do that very well. There are other times where I absolutely love what I see from him over the middle of the field, being able to attack gaps in Tampa too. I mean, some of the stuff that he does is really high NFL level stuff. But when we look at professional quarterbacks, you need that down to down consistency in your mechanics and in your decision-making that I don't see from him. 
on top of that, as you said, a decent athlete, but not somebody who is going to be a realistic rusher at the next level. I do have down here that he is an evasive creator. So just like Zach Wilson in college has the explosiveness, the lateral mobility to shake rushers and get free and create throwing lanes. But after that, he's not the kind of creator that Caleb Williams is. He doesn't have the consistency in his ball placement, in his general accuracy, once he gets on the move. And I think that his arm is very good in those situations, but it's not as consistent as those top level guys who are right now going to look like top five picks going into the 2024 NFL draft. And like you said, I think that he can get there with another year of experience in that offense. And with, I think the big thing is he has a, a legacy breathing down his neck behind him at Texas. He can't afford to not perform well mm-hmm. because if he doesn't perform well, the chants are going to come from the stadium for Arch Manning to come in and replace him. And so he needs to get the job done this year. He needs to get to the NFL draft because that clock is ticking and he has somebody breathing down his neck and how he handles that pressure at Texas, I think is going to say a lot for his NFL draft prospects going forward. Yep, it says a lot that, you know, he was a five-star recruit coming out and that hype always follows players and it's residual mm-hmm. year over year. And we see it, you know, every every year there's a former five-star who's getting round one hype. And, you know, obviously it's all subjective. You know, someone else might be a little higher on the arm talent and say, like, yeah, I would take that round one. But, you know, that sometimes causes people to turn a blind eye to the uncertainty that is there. There is a lot of room for refinement. And I think that's definitely one thing that showed up. Um, last guy, number six. Uh, he was in the top five for a while this offseason, and it was tough narrowing it down, man. It was really tough I mean, because I, you know, honestly, and I'll let you start with J.J. McCarthy because I remember you had some tweets about him uh, earlier in the summer, right? So I know we've both gotten a chance to watch him, but, you know, Michigan quarterback uh, took over for Michigan. Uh, he kind of took over for Caden McNamara, I want to say. You know, he had some reps in 2021, but 2022 was really when he got his starting reps and really kind of got into that rhythm for the first time. Um, some good moments, some bad J.J. McCarthy, our QB6 right now, uh, kind of in a similar bucket to yours, a young guy who still needs time to develop. But what have you seen from McCarthy? I I absolutely adore his arm. I, mm-hmm. I think May and Williams both have better arms overall. But some of the throws that J.J. McCarthy makes in that Michigan offense are truly special. Yeah. And he's one of those guys who, in the summer, it's great to love him. And it's fine to love him. And then I put him through my grading scale. And and he's a day three guy. It's like, it's one of those things where you have to take the heart out of it and think about things a little bit logically. Clean pocket, sturdy base, dude is money. Like you said, he's like 190 pounds at six foot four. Like he is a long, lanky dude. He needs to build a little bit more mass onto his frame. Um, He needs to be a better processor overall. I I have this play 24 versus PSU. His brain just breaks. He gets stuck on number one. Number two is wide open, five yards to his left, and he just does not see it, and he's right there. Uh, So like you said, young guy, he needs a little bit more experience. I think that when I look at him and why I think he's a really fun player, but I, I wonder about his overall ceiling is not that he's not a great athlete, because I, I th- actually think he is a very good athlete, and I think mm-hmm. that he could run at the next level. I just think it's incredibly hard to get a guy to run. You know, I covered the Dallas Cowboys for a podcast here and have covered the Dallas Cowboys since Dak Prescott became the starting quarterback. Dak Prescott, coming from Mississippi State, was a runner. And he was a very good one. He was very effective at it. He was great in short yardage situations. He was great in the read option game. Now, after the ankle injury, he, he just doesn't, run it's just it's out of his brain now that's not a part of his game and it's not a part of jj mccarthy's game when i think that it really should be more a part of his game Uh, i think that he needs to work quite a bit uh to become a full field guy i think that the quick game operation stuff you don't see it a ton in michigan's offense and that's part of what makes me love him and part of what scares me about him is very much like justin fields very much like cj stroud the quick game stuff isn't there and it's because they are throwing 10 to 20 yard passes 
all around the field all game. And it really gets to show your arm off. But the quick game is 65, 70% of the NFL game. It's getting the ball out fast. It's finding holes in zone coverage. And that's something that I don't see from him yet. And it's going to take a lot for me to get there with J.J. McCarthy this year. I don't know how much of that side of things we'll see at Michigan, but I am incredibly excited about the physical talent of J.J. McCarthy. Yeah, the physical talent is what stood out to me too. It's, uh, I kind of made the same notes. It's not. It's interesting because I feel like the arm isn't like hefty, like you think what, when you when you hear about a hefty arm. But he can throw he can throw some some ropes. He's got a hose for sure. It's it's more mm-hmm. elastic. It's more kind of that whiplash, that snap in it. But he can yes. generate legit velocity, and, and it shows up. And he can layer velocity and touch too. He's got that ability. You know, I think the arm elasticity is there for him and sometimes you don't see it unless he's kind of forced to use it like if there's pressure and he's fading back but he can do it you know he can just release just like that snap of the finger the ball is going sidearm release he can do that for sure so it's something he doesn't rely on as much as yours but it's definitely something he has in his toolbox and athletically i was very impressed with him too i I, there was one line in particular i remember writing that kind of stood out to me you know he he doesn't just have agility and explosiveness but there's kind of a flexibility with his athleticism mm-hmm. too, where he can bend around tackle threats as he's accelerating. And I think that in particular for evading pocket threats is very valuable, right? And I think, you know, against TCU, there were some flashes of his running ability, his independent running ability, you know, that creation capacity where, you know, he's showing that speed in open space. I know he had a rushing touchdown off of a read option where he showed very good vision, you know, getting inside the C gap after pressing outside. So, you know, flashes like that, you see them and you're like, all right, this is something that we can build on and actually be a central part of his game, right? I do think the size worries me a little bit. He's listed at 202 pounds right now. Want to see what Michigan has him at through the year because, you know, I want to see if he's added a little bit of bulk because he is a really lanky guy and it shows up. And that's one thing that kind of differentiates him from, you know, a Jeff Sims, right? Where Jeff Sims is 220. You can see that play strength. It does make a difference in tackling situations. So want to see that. To me, you know, as a thrower, J.J., yeah, I, I align with pretty much everything you said, right? I think, you know, Michigan's got a lot of vertical threats in their offense. Cornelius Johnson, Roman Wilson, they have speed guys and they like to use them down the field. They, they like to stretch them. And I think that works uh, to McCarthy's benefit at times, but also to his detriment at times because, you know, he doesn't get that quick game rhythm stuff like you said. I also think in the pocket, he's shown that he can navigate the pocket and and, you know, use micro movements. But at the same time, I think his poise can improve. I think there's a lot of times where if he encounters a direct pressure threat, he will hesitate. He will, you know, he will fall to indecision. He'll drop his eyes and try to run a little bit. You know, there's too much of a panic mode that comes in when you encounter pressure right now. And he's got the athleticism to evade, but right now it's it's not controlled. Um, and then at the same time, too, as you mentioned, delays going from read to read. I do think he is he has flashed that quick trigger at times. I do think he can lead read levels concepts, right? He can anticipate over the middle of the field. He's shown that he's he's shown it in glimpses, but the consistency is not there for me right now. And that, that's one thing that you know, I do think there's a little more on the on the flash side than with yours you know there's a little more for me to say I'm, I'm confident that mccarthy can reach that point than with yours um and the athleticism helps with that too because it is something that he can rely on in adverse situations if he needs to but definitely needs to keep you know growing keep maturing as a passer i think is the right word because he is so young he is so green um but at the very least, when you're scouting a young passer like this, things that you look for, right? Arm strength, velocity generation, arm elasticity, angle freedom, creation capacity, explosiveness, speed, uh, flexibility, all those things, right? And then, you know, showing those flashes of on the operational side, that's enough for me. And I think, you know, mechanically, he is he has a degree of natural mechanic mechanical feel where he can get into that rotational base right but again i think there's more room for control with him as well you know as you usually see from young qbs so you know enough for me to say i'm confidently putting him above yours and one of the top young qbs in this class i think it's up there between him and leonard for that top you know past williams and and may i think that's kind of where it starts but i'm excited to see what he can do because i think another year in that offense he's got a really strong offensive line again they've won the joe moore award two years in a row and they've got a ton of talent again uh, a lot of vertical threats i hope they incorporate more short game but he's got the talent to be a round one pick he really does i think the arm talent pops the athleticism pops it's just refining those operational parts of his game if he can do that the the ceiling is very high yeah i have a, a random tab on all of my 
like notes that I take just for random thoughts that don't really fit into anything else. Uh -huh. And uh, I have down here that he is an electric vehicle. Uh, the throwing motion, it lacks moving parts. It's just really compact. And like you said, it's very much kind of reminds me a little bit of how Baker Mayfield was able to generate so much velocity, quick whip like release gets through really is able to torque his, his torso and create velocity through the midsection and the arm just kind of follows and then whips back. It is uh it's a lot of fun to watch and I really enjoy his sequencing overall as well. I think he's got a really good feel for that as a young quarterback, but a lot to improve upon and we are going to skip the honorable mentions. We are not going to get to them. We are already at 35 minutes. We're going to get to the honorable mentions in another podcast because like I've said in the previous podcast, there are so many good quarterbacks or enticing quarterbacks in this upcoming draft that are fourth year, fifth year, six year seniors that we're going to have to talk about. And there are a couple in particular from the SEC, from my neck of the woods, that I really, really want to discuss because I have some strong feelings about them. Hashtag let, Slim Reaper. Slim Reaper is so. one of them. And then the exact opposite of that is KJ Jefferson from <laughs> Arkansas, who is not slim at all. He is a large human being. But we're going to talk about the prospects very quickly. We're going to just run through these. You do have a note on Jalen Maiden that I'm going to let you get to, but I'm mm -hmm. going to run through these names real quick. Sam Hartman, this is our prospects or potential prospects to watch in week zero of college football. That is Sam Hartman, the quarterback from Notre Dame, Chris Tyree, the wide receiver from Notre Dame, Jack Kaiser, linebacker from Notre Dame, Xavier Watt, safety from Notre Dame, Riley Mills, defensive tackle, Notre Dame, Javante Keen Baptiste. Jean Baptiste. Actually. Jean Bat yeah, you put a K there. I put a K there. Come is on, K man. right beside J and it J are right yeah. beside it, it happens. I should have known it was it John happens. because that looks weird. Uh <laughs> Gavin Hardison, quarterback UTEP. Tyrese Knight, linebacker UTEP. Praise Amawile. 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 See, you there's, know there's a these. U. I should let you. There's yeah. a U. Where am it's, I? It should be. It should be a U instead of an I. No yeah. way. How yeah, am sorry. I screwing these up? I swear, <laughs> I just copied these over. I think. I think you're good the rest of the way through. I think you're good. Uh, Clay Webb, offensive lineman from Jacksonville State. Curtis Rourke who his brother went off in the preseason the other week. This is the quarterback from Ohio, Jalen Maiden. Talk to me a little bit about Jalen Maiden. That would be the quarterback from San Diego State. Yeah, so I, I mentioned him because we're talking about quarterbacks today, and obviously, you know, he's not in the honorable mention category yet, but a uh, former four-star recruit who ran a 4.65 out of high school. He initially signed with Mississippi State and then eventually transferred to San Diego State and was a backup for most of his career, but broke out as a starter last year, uh, last year, uh, left-handed QB, uh, 6'3", 230 is what he's listed at. And he's got some running ability. He's got some toughness and he's got some velocity on his throws too. I think he has good arm strength. We mentioned the left-handed quarterback discussion earlier. Sometimes it's hard to gauge, but there are some throws where you're like, especially to the middle of the field where he got that out quick, got, got it to his target quick. Um, I'm excited to see what he can do against Ohio. It's going to be a good test for him uh, early yeah. on, and then if he can get a rhythm. But yeah, he's a he's a fun deep sleeper to watch a QB. That's a that's a quarterback battle right there. Watch Ohio San Diego State. Yes, sir. For anything, it's going to be for the quarterbacks. And then you, I know guys. I know Vanderbilt. I, I understand they don't win many games in the SEC. But they're going to win this football game, and they're going to win it because of guys like Will Shepard, the wide receiver from Vanderbilt. Love Will Shepard, personally. Yes. Jalen Mahoney, uh, defensive back from Vanderbilt. DeRicky Wright, which DeRicky is a fantastic yes. hyphenated – or not hyphenated name, but apostrophe name. DeRicky Wright, linebacker from Vanderbilt. Marshawn Lloyd, the running back from USC. And we, guys, USC has got so many prospects. It's, it's it's tough to go over them all. But Brendan Rice, wide receiver. Uh, Dorian Singer, wide receiver. Mario Williams, wide receiver. Taj Washington, wide receiver. Jarrett Kingston, guard. Mason Cobb, linebacker. Shane Lee, linebacker. And then Christian Roland Wallace, cornerback. There are so many. And we didn't even talk about Caleb Williams. because we Caleb don't. Bullock at safety as well, man. They've got they've got a ton. Yeah, of I forgot about Bullock. I, I don't even know how I forgot about Bullock. Because Bottom I, line, watch, try and get eyes on USC. That that yes. team is is loaded. Uh, Caleb Williams is is just the start of it. They've got a ton of talent. And, you know, every, every team, Week Zero will provide a good digestible preview for you. And then Week One, it is on to full speed action. And there's going to be almost too much to keep up with, but we'll try and do our best to do it. 
yeah, we will not talk about prospects to watch after <laughs> week zero because there's just going to be too many of them to yeah. watch. So, uh, yes, definitely get an eye on Notre Dame and get an eye on USC. And remember, guys, Notre Dame and Navy is in Dublin, Ireland. So that's going to be a lot of fun for our UK buddies. I know Ollie's got to be absolutely jacked yes, up for that one. I miss him. We need to get him on here at some point. To. As always, guys, thank you for listening. I love you guys. And we will be back on Tuesday with an update on how things went in week zero. I love you guys. Goodbye.